Well, it is good to be with you this morning. Turn to your neighbor and give him a high five. Say, three days till Christmas. How many people are excited? Got your shopping done. How many of you are praying for a white Christmas? Raise your hand. Huh? How many? Oh, you guys are sick. How, how many of you guys are praying for 65 and sunny? Yes, my people. I told the early service this. Let's just pack up and move south. Just as a big church family, just kind of get in some warmer weather. Man, it's good. But before we get started uh, this morning, I just want to address something because many people have come up and asked me questions about it or made remarks about my beard. And uh, so first off, I, I, I am well aware that No Shave November is over. Like at no point in my life have I ever been in this thought process that I couldn't shave, right? Um, and so No Shave November may be over, but this month is Don't Shave December. So second thing, I don't know when I'm going to shave it. Like, I don't have a countdown on my phone. I don't, like, have a calendar, you know, it's 10 days, I'm going to shave my beard. Like, so I, I don't know you can stop asking me that. Third, just because you don't like beards doesn't mean that my wife doesn't like my beard. Okay? She loves it. And she told me, I quote, it's at least better than your mullet. She digs it. She loves it. Okay? And fourth, no, Jan, I'm not joining the Amish community, okay? <laughs> so, now that we've got that cleared up, let's get in God's Word. Turn in your Bibles to John 13. Jan, Jan, Jan. We inten intentionally this morning had a shorter time of worship uh, because at the end, after I preach, uh, it just demands worship. And so we're going to end in a couple songs of worship at the end. So as I have people stand at the end and there's a response and we go back into worship, that's not your chance to rush to the early childhood line to beat the crazies there. It's not your chance to rush to the, the buffet and beat the Baptist there. This is your opportunity to worship the Lord. Because that's what we've done. That's why we've come to church is to worship God. And I think that for all that he's given us, which is everything, I think the least that we can do is stay engaged all the way through the end. See, there's something to do with worshiping God with your intellect, where, where you dig down deep and you say, this is true, and I know it's true because I've dug long enough and I've dug hard enough that I've found bedrock where I can build my life off of that. And so there's worshiping God in intellect, but there's also worshiping God in song. And so that's how we're going to end today's service. And when I have people stand up, that's not the time for you guys to, to just uh, take off and, and, and leave. We're continuing in this series, It's a Wonderful Life. Some of you have a hard time believing that a life that is rooted in Jesus Christ really is a wonderful life. And, and it's sometimes hard believing that because things such as fear or anxiety or busyness or, or guilt and shame or depression or loneliness can rob us of the wonderful life that God has created us to live. And this morning I'm going to be speaking to you about guilt and shame and how that can rob us from living a wonderful life. Satan is an accuser, and he wants you to be reminded of your past sins and mistakes, but I believe that the Spirit of God is here this morning, and he's saying, not today, Satan. Turn to your neighbor and say, not today. Man, not today. No more guilt, no more shame, no more reminding me of something that I did that's already been paid for. No more living in chains of self-imprisonment. No more lies from the enemy. Not today, Satan. The Lord is the one who created today. And therefore, the Lord is the only one who has authority that can say what today holds. And as we read scripture, we know that today holds forgiveness. And today holds mercy and grace and a kindness that leads to repentance. Not today. Today is a day of freedom. And if you walked in here wondering if the Lord could ever love you, he not only can, he does. While, while similar, guilt and shame are very different. One is true, the other is a choice. 
Guilt is a legal term. The actual definition of guilt is the fact of having committed a specified offense or crime. And, and the definition of the word guilty is culpable of or responsible for a specified wrongdoing. They are legal terms. In the courtroom of justice, when you are guilty, that means you are convicted, you are tried, and you, you are standing accused. When we mess up and we fall short of the standard of God, we stand before God guilty. We are standing in guilt. Romans 3.23 tells us, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And, and if you've ever grown up or heard about the Romans Road, which is an evangelistic tool of, of helping people understand their need for Christ, you know, Romans 3.23 is one of those verses that people like to quote. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And, and, and while that is very true, and while it is true that we are all tried and convicted and found guilty before God, if, if we miss the context of this verse, we are m missing the full meaning of, of this passage. I know I had you turn to, to John 13. We're going to get there, but this is very important. Romans chapter 3, taking a look at the context of, of uh, this verse. Verse 19 says this, Now we know that whatever the law says... It says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Okay, the law came to us in ten simple rules. How many have ever broken the Ten Commandments? How many have ever lied or cheat or, or stolen or lusted or, or held something of value uh, above God and, and valued it more than God and had, had something else in front of God. So don't even kid yourself this morning thinking that you can somehow earn your way to God. Because there is a law that shows us that we miss the mark. We see this in verse 20. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. That puts you and I in the same boat. It says no one can get to God by being good enough. Turn to your neighbor and say, guilty. That's what you are. That's what I am. We are in the same boat. And, and because there's a law, because there's a standard, we can look to that and then it makes us aware that we are short and it makes us aware that we need a savior. Now these next verses are where things start to change and I thank God that it does, verse 21. But now righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known. This is good news because we're all sunk if, if it was up to our goodness. We've all come short, and, and, and this is good news, that there is something apart from the law that can make us righteous before God. Verse 22, this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Faith in Jesus Christ to all who believes. I want to remind you this morning that the gospel is for all people. It is not prejudiced. It is not racist, and it is not selective. It is available to all of us through faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 23 and 24, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And I think sometimes we, we say that verse and, and it's like a period, but I've said this before, the verse doesn't stop right there. That's only a part of the sentence, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God comma, and are all justified freely by his grace. Justified is a part of salvation. Salvation is a three-step process. If you're taking notes, this isn't in my notes, but this is good stuff, okay? So when you are saved, it's a three-step process. The first thing that happens when you are saved is a process called justification, meaning you are being made just as if you'd never saved. In that process, God is saving you from the penalty of your sin, justified, being saved from the penalty of your sin. Then we enter into this process called sanctification, which is where I believe most of us today are at, where, where sanctification is a process of becoming holy, where God is now not just saving you from the penalty of your sin, God is saving you from the power of your sin, sanctification. And eventually, when, when salvation is complete, it's the day of glorification, and that's the third part of salvation, where we eventually join Christ in heaven, and we are glorified, and God is not just saving us from the penalty of our sin. He's not just saving us from the power of our sin. He is saving 
keeping us from the very presence of sin. And so we see that all are justified freely by his grace, meaning it is a gift. This is nothing that you can earn through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. That is the best news that you or I could have today, and it's worth praising the Lord in this moment and for the rest of our lives, because there is a God who loves you so much that while you were standing in your guilt, when you were tried and convicted, standing there guilty, he stepped down when you could do nothing, and he did everything so that you could be in heaven with him someday. Somebody praise the Lord this morning. I believe that there are many people that have come here tired and exhausted, frustrated, maybe even hateful towards Lord, the Lord because this message has been twisted and perverted and, and somehow you feel like you need to earn God's love and earn his forgiveness. Can I just be the first to tell you this morning that God's grace cancels your guilt. What that means is the penalty for your offense has been paid for in full. Colossians 2, 13 through 14 says it perfectly. When you were dead in your sins, meaning when you were standing in your flesh, when you were standing in your shortcomings, when you were tried and convicted in your guilt, when you were dead in your sins, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. This is amazing. Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken that away, nailing it to the cross. What a beautiful word picture directly from Scripture. It's not about what we can do. It's all about what God has done. See, grace flips the script from failure to family. It is free when we put our trust and faith not in ourselves but in Jesus Christ and what he did for us over 2,000 years ago on the cross. And this is good news sometimes seems too good to be true and, and, and religious and uh, religious pride comes over us and says, oh, this offer is too good. There must be more. There, there's a, a catch. I remember several years ago for my birthday, someone gave me this, this voucher uh, gift. And it was for something that was free that would normally cost a couple hundred dollars. And, and then I read in the fine print, offer expires yesterday. It was a gag. You know, it was like, it's just, have you ever seen those lottery tickets where people freak out and they read the fine print? And it's like, you know, it's, no, never, okay, obviously not. Okay. <laughs> It was a gag, you know, like, I was all excited. I thought I had, I'd gotten this free gift that was worth a ton of money, and then I read this offer expired yesterday. Can I just be the, just a reminder of, of you, <laughs> remind you this morning that the amazing offer of God's grace never expires. It's not a gag. There's no catch. If you walked in here wondering if God could love you, he, he not only can but he does. If you walked in here overwhelmed in guilt and shame, God wants to set you free of that, to forgive you, to place your feet on a path of righteousness, and he's calling you to something greater. God came running to you in your guilt, but he doesn't want you to choose to continue to live in shame. I haven't even got to my main text this morning, and I'm already preaching. Turn to your neighbor and say, saddle up, partner, because it's going to be... It's going to be a ride. My last name is definitely Weaver, so you should just know what you're getting into. John 13, starting in verse 33, Jesus is with his disciples. He had just washed their feet, and he predicted that one of them would betray him. And Judas was the, the disciple that was going to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. This is taking place a couple hours before the Garden of Gethsemane where he's going to be arrested and taken in. This is the same night, just hours before the process of crucifix, the crucifixion of Jesus' death was going to start. And Jesus is talking to his disciples, starting in verse 33. It says this, My children, I will be with you only a little longer. 
you will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I'm going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. If you want to know if you're saved or you're not, ask yourself this, do you genuinely love everyone? I see some really hateful things on the internet coming from Christians in the spirit of truth. And it's wrong. It's one thing to stand up for what you believe and, and, and to believe in truth and what we believe, but there's another thing to say, look, I see that you're caught. I see that maybe we see things differently, but that doesn't mean that I can't love you. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? Will you really do that, Peter? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Peter says, I will lay down my life for you, Lord. Essentially, he's saying, I'm with you. I will never deny you. I'm with you till the, I'll take a bullet for you. I'm on your team, Jesus. We, we brothers, we, we're together, we're in this. I, I'll, I'll never deny you. How many times do we sound like Peter? You know, the day we get saved, I'm a new creation, Lord. I'm never gonna swear again. I'm never gonna do this again. I'm new, and, and I will follow you with my whole heart. Everything that I am, God, I am yours. And, and we, we get saved, or, or then we, 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 we rededicate our lives. We realign our lives to, to, to uh, Jesus Christ and his ways, and we're like, oh, no more. I'm done. I'm leaving this behind me, and I am all yours, Jesus. I'll never deny you where you go. I'll go. I'll follow you. I'll do this. And, and, and I believe that there's nothing wrong with, with that declaration. I believe that your heart and my heart is very sincere in that moment. And I believe that in this story that we just read, Peter's intentions and his heart was pure. I really do believe that he meant what he said. He just didn't know how hard it was going to be. How many know that it's easier to say what you believe than it is to show what you believe? Say, oh me, if you relate, huh? <laughs> the apostle Paul says it best, I do what I, I don't want to do, and I don't do what I want to do. Your heart is at war with itself. Deep down, your desire and your intentions are pure, but the struggle is real. And Peter says, no way, Lord, not me. I'm with you till the end. I got your back, and Jesus predicts that he'll deny him three times before the rooster crows. Jump in your Bibles to John 18. This is just a few hours later. We see Jesus in the garden, and, and Judas has betrayed him. There's a small um, band of soldiers that have come to arrest him in the garden of Gethsemane. And in verse 10, Peter draws a sword, and he chops off the high priest's servant's ear, Malchus. Now, this is very important. I want you to see that Peter was the original Mike Tyson, okay? He was ready to fight. In that moment, nothing had changed with Peter's heart from chapter 13. Chapter 13, I'm with you till the end. I will die for you, Lord. In chapter 18, let's fight. Let's go. I'm ready to take this to the end, Lord. I'm with you. But how many know that Jesus didn't come to wage war, but he came to bring peace? And Jesus is like, hold on, Peter, this is not why I came. This is not God's way. And he submits himself, and they take him, and they arrest him, and they walk to the high priest's house. Now, I've been to Israel, and between Caiaphas' house and the Garden of Gethsemane, there's a 16 to 20-minute walk. 16 to 20 minutes. I've stood in the Garden of Gethsemane. I have stood in Caiaphas' house. I've literally been there, seen it with my own eyeballs. Uh, it's, it's amazing. Let's jump to verse 15, see what happens. Simon Peter and another disciple 
were following Jesus as, as he's being arrested. And because this disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the priest's courtyard. So this is John talking really weird. Like this is John talking, because they knew me, I got to go into the priests. You know, and he's just kind of, he, he does this. The one whom the Lord loved. That's John, okay? But Peter had to wait outside the door. The other disciple who was known to the high priest, John, he's talking about himself, came back, spoke to the servant girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. You aren't one of this man's disciples too, are you? She asked Peter. He replied, no habla inglés, right? No, I am I am not. It was cold, and the servants and officials stood around a fire they had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing with them, warming himself. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teachings. Jesus said, I have spoken openly to the world. I was always taught in synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews came together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby slapped him in the face. Is this the way you answered the high priest? He demanded. If something I said, or if I said something wrong... Jesus replied, testify as to what is wrong, but if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Meanwhile, Simon Peter was standing there warming himself around the fire. So they asked him, you aren't one of his disciples too, are you? He denied it, saying, I'm not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the garden? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the rooster began to crow. What changed in those 30 minutes? You've got Peter that's chopping off a dude's ear saying, I'm with you till the end. And now you've got Peter standing around a fire saying, I don't know who this is. Jesus who? Who? What? I'm, I'm not with him. I'm just, I'm just here, you know. What happened? What happened to his heart? Did anything happen to his heart? What changed? Was the temptation and test too great for Peter to handle? I can only imagine that when Peter heard that rooster, his heart sank to the bottom of his stomach. Oh, you, you know that feeling. You just got done doing something that you swore you'd never do ever again. You just got mad and you yelled at your kids. You just got back from the bar. You just finished up on that website. You just lied to your spouse, and now it feels like you swallowed this brick, and it just sinks down to the bottom of your stomach. You see, Satan is smart. Satan is very smart when he comes and he tempts us. Because first he comes and he tempts us. He says, oh, do this thing. Nobody will know. It'll be fun. It'll bring you happiness. This will, this will complete you. It, it doesn't really affect anything. It's just this one little thing. Come on, just do this, do this, do this. And then in a weak moment in our flesh, we fall to that temptation and we, we sin. We miss God's mark. We, we, we fall to that temptation and we make a mistake. And then shortly after, Satan, the same one who just told you to do that, comes back and he says, how disgusting. How could you ever? You should be ashamed of your... God is ashamed of you. you. You disgust God. And now we see not just the tempter, but also the accuser, and he's casting this shame on you, and then shortly later he comes back to you, not just with temptation, not just with shame, but he comes back with a mixture of the two. And he says, you might as well go and, and do it again, because now you're a drunk and you'll always be this way. It's who you are. You're a cheat, you're a slut, you're a liar, you're an addict. And soon, your shortcomings become your identity. Shame is the process of reshaping your identity based upon your shortcomings. Satan uses shaming to get you to fall back into more shortcomings. This is exactly what happens to an individual who's lured into human trafficking. Someone says, oh, come on, baby, just do it. Just do it. Yeah, you've got it. And then as soon as they do it, oh, you're disgusting. You would do that? Oh, man, nobody's going to want you. You're filthy. If, if you go anywhere, I'll tell your mom and your dad what you'll do. They don't want you back. You're dirty. 
You might as well just go ahead and live as a used product. You, you might as well just go ahead and just do what you just did because you're no better than that. And, 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 and I, I want to ask you this. How come it's so easy for us to see the sick manipulation in something like human trafficking, but when it comes to us in our own sin, when Satan, the tempter, and the accuser, and the shamer comes in and uses those same tactics, how come we can't identify it with our own sin? It's absolutely disgusting. Shame holds you as a prisoner to your past. And once Satan can get us to the point of living a life filled with shame, a couple of things can take place. The first thing that shame can lead us to is something called selective amnesia. Selective amnesia. And what this is, it's just simply rewriting history. It's choosing to remember what you want to remember. It's it's somehow taking the offense that you committed and lessening and saying, oh, you know what, if they weren't so this way, then I wouldn't have done that. Steal from your work. Oh, well, they're rich. They've got hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's, It's really no big deal. They'll never miss it. You know, and, and we just, we like to select what we choose to remember. And somehow, in, in what we like to remember, it's supposed to lessen our guilt and lessen the punishment. And it's, it's a coping mechanism of our guilt. The second thing that living in shame will do is it encourages you to hide from God and hide from others. You start to build a fence around your life so that others can't see the junk that's in your yard. Think back with me to Genesis chapter 2. It's Adam and Eve and and God in the garden. They only had one rule. Don't eat of the forbidden fruit, right? And everything's good. It's Gucci, right? They're they're like, man, we've got this down, and and, um, there's, there's, I mean, I'm walking with God. I'm I'm with my my wife, and and they're walking in the garden in chapter 2. And in verse 25, it says that Adam and his wife were walking naked in the garden and felt no shame. And then in chapter 3, they break the one rule that God gave them to follow. They eat of the forbidden fruit, and when they hear God's footprints, step, footprints, not footprints, you can't hear footprints. When, <laughs> when they heard God's walking, what did they do? They ran and they hid. That is exactly what Satan wants you to do. He wants you to run away from the merciful Father, and he wants you to run away from those that are godly, that will encourage you and build you up, because Satan knows that if he can isolate you, he can more easily defeat you. You you, you understand why Jesus establishes the church, right? It's so that we can gather together, that we can edify, which means to build up. We can encourage each other. We can be real with one another. We don't don't have Sunday school here at church, a Sunday school hour, just for another thing to do. We don't have Wednesday night classes just so that you can busy your lives even more. We don't have um, small groups and shared interest groups just so that you can just be a better person or somehow that's going to earn you to heaven or anything. We have those things because we're better together. And Christ established the, the, the church and he calls it his bride. He loves it. And when we come together, there's something powerful in that. And I really think that some people struggle with guilt and shame because all they do is they kind of come to church once a week for an hour and 15 minutes and they kind of acknowledge God, you know, and they know that God is there. But they haven't really embraced into who God is and his people. And and so you're, you're running from those relationships out of fear of, of, of being judged, out of fear of feeling guilt. Can I just tell you, we all have junk. We're, we're not perfect. Sometimes we look at Instagram, we scroll through the feed, and we're, we're as Pastor Zach always says to the middle schoolers, Luke, we're seeing someone else's highlight reel, and we're comparing it to our real life in the situation. It's easy to feel this big when you see someone living it up, you know, at an all-inclusive or whatever else, and we're here stuck grinding away 40 hours a week plus a part-time job just to make ends meet. Let's join together and uphold one another. Back to Scripture. I got to preaching again. 
In chapters 19 and 20, Jesus was crucified. He died, and then he rose again, and he appeared to Mary Magdalene and to the disciples two times in a week span. And Peter has seen Jesus Christ with his own eyes. Peter has interacted with Christ two different times. He has seen the loving Father. And we jump to chapter 21, starting in verse 1. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples. So this is the third time by the Sea of Galilee. And it happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. And Simon Peter says, I'm going out to fish. Peter goes to his old way of life. He says, I'm going fishing. Now, could it have been that they were hungry and they just needed to get some fish? Possibly. But the reason why I don't necessarily believe that's the case is because in chapter 20, verse 21, Jesus is speaking to his disciples and he says this, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am am sending you. He reinstates and he reaffirms the disciples' calling. And he not only does that, he breathes on them and then gives them the authority to forgive sins. And he sends them out. Yet in verse 3, we see Peter say, I'm going fishing. Could it have been the guilt and the shame? Could it have been that Peter was holding himself to a prisoner of the past? The text doesn't explicitly say that's why he went fishing, but you have to wonder if Peter was thinking, I'm going fishing because I'm unworthy to be sent out. This Jesus business is for someone else. I've screwed up too badly. I'm too ashamed. But look what the scripture says in verse 3. I'm going fishing. And the disciples said, we'll go with you. Don't be deceived this morning to think that when you return to your old way that there won't be others who follow you. It might be your family, it might be your friends, it might be your co-workers, but you never return alone. We'll go with you. Hear me, don't give up this morning. Don't go back to your old way this morning. Just because you don't like the scene that you're in right now doesn't mean that you're going to not like the end of the story. Because the devil wants you to write your story based off of your current scene, but we know how the story ends. And you can tell the devil this morning that I have a God whose grace cancels my guilt. And when I stand free of guilt as an innocent man covered under the blood of Jesus Christ and God looks down me as an innocent man, then I don't need to live in shame. Let's read again, looking the second half of verse 3. So they, being Peter and the disciples, went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. You ever been fishing and the fish ain't biting? Oh man, your mind can start to wander. I wonder what Peter was thinking that night, long night, throw the net out, reel it in, throw the net out over and over and over. He's thinking, man, I can't even catch a fish without Christ. This isn't what I'm supposed to be doing. This isn't what God has called me to. What am I doing going back to this way of living? This is no way of living. We read in verse 4 of 21. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, John, said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon, I love this, as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire burning coals, and there were fish on it and some bread. And then in verse 12, Jesus says, come sit down, let's have some breakfast. I love it. 
when Peter sees Christ and he hears his voice, he jumps out of his boat and he runs to Christ. He swims to Christ and Christ receives him. And I've got a feeling this morning that we've got some Peters that are in the boat of guilt and shame and they need to jump out of your boat and run to Jesus. And Jesus isn't going to be standing there ready just to punch you in the face. He's going to be sitting there around a fire with some fish on it. He's going to say, let's have some breakfast. Fish for breakfast. Mediterranean culture. And I can just imagine that Peter, around just the the embers of the fire, sees Jesus. He sees his sweet face. You don't, you don't, you don't want to hurt me, Jesus? No. I just want to serve you. So you're going to serve me and then you're going to hurt me. No. I just want to serve you. And then in verses 15 through 17, it gets better. Peter has denied Christ three times. And the Lord asks him three different times, Peter, do you love me? He says, yes, I love you. He says, feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Take care of my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know all things, and you know that in my heart I love you. And be of my work, feed my sheep. See, in that moment, Jesus doesn't just forgive Peter of his wrongdoing. He reinstates and reaffirms Peter's calling and commissioning. And I believe with every fiber in me that this morning, someone who's been living on a guilt trip in a boat in shame is going to get out of your boat, get out of your scene, run to Jesus, and he's going to be there. And he's not just going to forgive you, but he is going to reinstate you into his purpose for your life. Musicians, would you come? We're about ready to sing some songs of praise. God deserves our praise. He is worthy. But I feel that some of you are in this weird place right now. And and, and you're just saying like, although I don't really feel super close to God in this moment, like, Hey, God, you know, even though I don't feel super intimate with him in this moment, I believe everything that you said this morning. I believe that, that what the, the word says is true, that, that I'm forgiven. I believe that God has forgiven me of, of my past and that his grace has canceled my guilt. I believe that. But then you're quick to add this. I just can't forgive myself. I just can't forgive myself. That is a message straight from the devil. That is a handcrafted message straight from Satan himself. Let's just, let's just examine that statement. Let's just do some forensics on that statement for a minute, can we? You never could forgive yourself. I just can't forgive myself. Hello? You never were in a position where you could forgive yourself. That's the beautiful thing about it. When you are standing, tried, convicted, and standing in your guilt, unable to do anything about about it, God stepped down from glory in heaven, and he did something that only he could do, and he chose to forgive you. So you don't even need to worry about forgiving ourselves because we can't even forgive ourselves. Only God can forgive ourselves. You might be thinking, oh, you don't understand. I can't just 
take myself off the hook. You're just twisting words, Austin. I, I feel like I can't move forward in life. I'll always live with this stigma. I just need to do something in order to make it up to God. Can I gently suggest to you this morning to humble yourself under the work of the cross of Jesus Christ and say these words of highest praise possible. I agree with God. I agree with God. And if he says that I'm a loved daughter, then I say I'm a loved daughter. If he says that I'm forgiven and free, then I say I'm forgiven and free. If he says that his son bore my guilt and shame, then I say I'm not going to bear something that's already been bore by Jesus Christ. If he says that I can go forward, I say I can go forward. I'm going to stop agreeing with myself, and I'm going to start agreeing with God. I agree with God breaks the pride of I can't forgive me. Listen, Jesus has wronged the bell of freedom and that bell has shook hell's gates but when you say I can't forgive me that's like saying God you rung that bell but it's only good enough when I say it's good enough well I've got news for you this morning it's good enough it's good enough. You need to hand in your script this morning and get a new script. You need to hand in your script of I just can't forgive myself and receive the new script that says I agree with God. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes this morning? If you're here this morning and you've never asked Jesus to be Lord and Savior of your life and you want to do that, you're calling on the name of Jesus. You're asking for the forgiveness of your debt and your shortcomings. You're stepping into a relationship with Jesus through faith, which is trusting obedience. And, and you're just saying, right now, I recognize my need for a Savior, and I'm calling on Jesus. I'm turning from my old ways. I'm getting out of my boat, and I'm following Jesus. I'm running after him for the first time in your life. Would you just raise your hand and look up at me? I want to be able to pray for you, saying, I'm asking Jesus into my heart. Is there anyone here? Now look. Just raise your hand and look at me if there's anyone here. Yes. Sir, would you just pray in your heart after me? God, forgive me. Save me. Come into my life and change me. I'm sorry for what I've done, but I'm thankful for what you did. And I stand and believe in you, Jesus Christ. So take my life and lead it to where you want me to go, God. Forgive me, save me, give me the peace and assurance of salvation. Enter my heart today. In Jesus' name. If you're here this morning and you would say, I've been living on the boat of guilt and shame, but today I'm getting off this boat. I'm jumping ship and I'm running to Jesus. I'm turning in this script and I'm exchanging it for a new script. I'm standing on what God has done for me and he nailed my sin and my indebtedness to the cross and said, it is finished. So now I say in my heart, it is finished. I agree with God. If you're here this morning and you are stepping out of shame, of something that's already been paid for, I want you to stand to your feet right now all across this room saying, I have done it, I recognize it, but I know that I have a Lord and Savior that has forgiven me. Is there anyone else that would say, I am done living in this boat. I am done living in guilt and in shame. I will no longer live a prisoner of the past, but I look forward to my Lord and Savior. Jesus, I pray right now across this room for those who are standing God, the guilt, the shame, all the horrible things that we've done, Lord. You are so much bigger and greater. 
And so, God, I just pray a release. I pray that the chains of shame would be broken in Jesus' name. I pray for people that have been struggling with something that they did 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. And they've been living in that shame, God. I pray that that would begin to break and that they would begin to see your face, that they would draw in close around the fire and and, and they would sit and they would eat with you, that they would focus on you and they would hear your loving words of I love you, you're forgiven, now go. In Jesus' name, would you stand all across this room? We're gonna end in the only way that I see fit. And that's by singing this praise. These two songs that I selected this morning so perfectly embody who Jesus is and what he's done for us. This is not a time to slip out. This is is a time where we are going to worship to the Lord. So I'm gonna pray and we're gonna sing, Jesus, right now may you be glorified in this place. May we look back at what you've done to give us hope for today and a bright future of tomorrow, Lord. And so we love you and we proclaim you as Lord and King. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen, amen. God, I pray that everyone would leave here with no more chains, no more shame their eyes fixed on what you've done for us, God. I pray that hearts that are broken would be healed. I pray that forgiveness would flow to those who have been wounded and hurt the most. I pray that your love and your mercy and your grace and your presence would surround them, that they wouldn't just intellectually read the book as a piece of history, but that they would experience you in a way that is real. Fill our hearts with your spirit, with your love, your kindness, your gentleness. peace, your joy. We need you, Jesus. We praise you, God.